This is Fred Iantorno, and welcome to Tech Talk 360, sponsored by AirPro Diagnostics. I want to thank Lenny Margo, Michael Quinn, Josh McFarlane, and Team AirPro for making this possible. Our goal is to present topics that you won't normally see in other webinars. Tech Talk 360 is presented approximately every other month. Uh, the next webinar will be held November 20th, so mark your calendars. I'd like, now like to turn things over to our two great hosts, Jordan Hendler and George Avery. George? I like hearing that. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Thank you, Fred. Hi, uh, Jordan. How are you? Good. Thank you. Glad well, to be here. We got, uh, well, we'll just start off real quick. Uh, Jordan and I, I think you probably know Jordan and I pretty well, but we'll just start off. Jordan, I'll let you start just real quick with an introduction. Of course, we'll get to Stephen in just a minute. But I thought if you wanted to say a couple words, and I will as well, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Yeah, thanks, George. So I'm Jordan Hendler. Uh, I am with the Collision Industry Conference. I own a company called Admin Concepts that does administration for associations in the collision industry uh, primarily. So I work with the Collision Industry Conference, Society of Collision Repair Specialists, Washington Metro Auto Body Association. I have been in the collision industry for this is my 26th year, which um, I started when I was like 10. Um, <laughs> and uh, I I love hosting with you, George, on this, especially being able to represent the repair side viewpoint. So most of the questions that I ask would would come from that perspective. So I'll let you. Uh, yeah, give and then I'll be. To, I'm, and I'm. Uh, I like being here as well. Uh, I'm going to cover kind of the insurance side. Uh, and when it comes to some things, but I'll tell you one thing, number one, thanks to uh, AirPro uh, for putting this on. I think it really demonstrates how even when it's not within their scope or what they do, they are very interested in getting information out to technicians and others. So this is a great deal and uh, they have great products as well. Uh, as far as mine, I, I'm a past chair of CIC, past uh, president of National Auto Body Council, still pretty active. Uh, in the in collision industry, and I'm uh, very active with the National Auto Body Council with their first responder program. I also have the Insurance Roundtable, which is a new uh, new little uh, kind of deal we've got going that, to help insurers get the information they need, and uh, really a pleasure to be on, be on the call. Uh, so I, I guess my one thing is, this is a good one. Uh, as far as the topic today, I would encourage you to call your friends and say, hey, get on the call, you know, get get them the information they need. But I, uh, I, I would really encourage uh, if if you start going through this and you hear something, go, hey, I know some people that need to hear this. Please reach out to them and have it join us. So with that, uh, any other comments? Otherwise, we'll do a little housekeeping. Uh, Jordan, I can do the antitrust real quick. Sure, go for it. Uh, as you know, we have to read this out loud. Uh, as participants of this uh, webinar, we need to be mindful of constraints of antitrust laws, there shall be no discussions of agreements or concerted actions that may restrain competition. This prohibition includes the exchange of information concerning individual prices, rates, coverages, market practices, of course, claim settlement practices, and any other uh, competitive aspect of an individual company's operation. So each participant, that's you, is <laughs> obligated to speak up immediately for the purposes of preventing any discussion that falls outside these bounds. And I always say that Jordan and I monitor that pretty well, but we will always look to you that if there's a time that you feel uncomfortable, or if there's an issue with antitrust, we'd certainly like you to, to uh, speak out. And the way you would do that is through the Q&A uh, function. So Jordan, did you want to cover real quick how we're going to take the questions through the Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I'll echo, George and I have a lot of experience, good, good, bad, or indifferent with <laughs> making sure people don't cross that antitrust line. Uh, so, so we'll definitely keep everything in, in the box. Uh, on, on today's call, we have the Q&A function as our audience interaction function. So if along the way you have a question that you would like to ask of the speaker or of the host, um, of the content, then I will be monitoring the Q&A. If I see a question pop up, we'll decide if that's something to um, pause Stephen with and ask the question then, or if we'll just hold it till the end. So just so you guys know, if your question doesn't get asked immediately, we will have a question and answer portion at the end of the seminar. So just hold, just know that we're holding them for then. And if there are questions that are similar, oftentimes I'll group them together and ask them together. So just so you know that too, Stephen, um, 
you don't have to monitor uh, or stop yourself to answer questions. I'll definitely help you along the way, support you there. Uh, but I already can tell by this presentation that I will have my own questions too. So really looking forward to the audience interaction. Yeah, Stephen, welcome. Glad to have you. I know you have Stephen. You go by Steve or Stephen. So we'll, I'll probably interchange that only because I'm stuck with George. That's all I got. I don't got nothing other right. than just that. <laughs> So, uh, Stephen, welcome. Stephen's here. He's a mobility application engineer. I'm going to let him talk about uh, what he does and, and uh, introduce himself in a way uh, that you know, ties it to what he's going to do on the presentation. But with that, Jordan, unless there's we're missing a step, uh, let's move forward and get Stephen uh, running because he's got some great information. And as I said before, I would call, call somebody and say, get on this call. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to find this interesting. Definitely. Thank you, Stephen. We're looking forward and, to it. And George, Great. And George, we will uh, have a, a recording of this afterwards, and we'll be able to share the link, too. So Perfect. Perfect. Right. Go on, All Stephen. right, Stephen. Well, we're going to let you get to it. Uh, and uh, like, like Jordan said, I have a couple questions as well. So we'll, we'll just, uh, when I find the right time, we'll ask that. And of course, as Jordan said, she'll be, both of us will be monitoring the questions. So with that, Thanks for being here and uh, share with us uh, uh, what you've got today in, in printing these parts. I think this is pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, George, Jordan, and Fred for having me uh, and all of your sponsors for having a, a, such a cool uh, series. This is going to be pretty sweet, and I'm pretty excited to talk to you guys today. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Steve Korzik. I'm an application engineer at HP in the multi-jet fusion business unit. Uh, HP has got a 3D printing group, uh, and it has one technology, and it's producing plastic parts. But uh, HP is not my first exposure to additive manufacturing. Right out of college, I was actually a capital project manager at 3M. While I was there, I was an additive manufacturing customer. So we were using parts in manufacturing processes, web lines, assembly stations, things like that. And I was an end customer there. I was really inspired by it uh, and actually was offered a position to move back to my home state in Michigan at General Motors as a process engineer for additive. And in that role, I was improving the additive manufacturing processes to reduce cost and ultimately drive adoption within General Motors and its supply base. At General Motors, I was exposed to all the technologies and there was one that really stood out in terms of being able to make that jump from prototyping to true manufacturing, and that was HP. So when they came to me with a position, I happily accepted and I jumped over to the HP this year. 3D printing, additive manufacturing, we call them interchangeably. Um, it's something as a personal passion of mine. And I was offered a position also at University of California, Merced, where I actually now teach a four credit college class that counts four college credit towards their engineering degree called Introduction to Introduction industrial additive manufacturing. So 3D printing is my life. If I come home with another 3D printer without a good use for it, my wife is gonna be quite upset. So uh, I'm really passionate about all of this stuff and please do jump in on the Q&A with questions. Um, although this presentation is heavily HP focused, um, I am I love to consider things as a uh, non-biased background because as much as I would love to tell you that HP fixes every single process and issue ever out there, there will be cases where it may not actually be the best uh, application or best use of technology for additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing having such a big background, there's a lot of other things that are out there that may make a little bit more sense than using HP's tech, but my job is to hopefully make HP be that best tech. So uh, looking at the automotive industry as a whole, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges that are not necessarily additive manufacturing related. Uh, you have a very complex supply chain with all of the tiers, and that translates all the way down to collision repair as well, where if you're waiting for a part for some time that's backordered, that ultimately impacts the end customer. Injection molding, long lead times can often drive some of that complex supply chain. If a mold is damaged or lost or something like that, it ends up impacting everybody all the way down the line. Aftermarket supplies, you know, storing stock can be uh, a challenge as well, especially if there's unpredictable needs for those stocks. Um, if there's all of a sudden a big influx of 
some specific random component and it goes out of stock, that could end up triggering some of those supply chain disruptions that we've seen in the past, particularly when it was like a COVID driven huge external events or like a hurricane or a tornado or something like that. Um, you could end up in a really tight spot very quickly. Something that's not going to be very related to the collision industry is design iterations or improvements um, in, in the by the time it makes it down to the collision area, typically the designs are, are well known and well understood. And if there are changes, they're being made to injection molds, not necessarily 3D printing designs. Um, and then prototyping also is probably not super related to the, to the collision area, but um, it is something that does impact automotive as a whole. So what can MJF do for automotive to help address some of those issues? And this isn't necessarily just MJF, but it could be all additive manufacturing as well. And it gives you sort of three major improvements that would have a direct impact. The first is, is design freedom. So if you're not having to injection mold something, now you can come out and do a crazy design that would you know, typically drive a, a million dollar injection mold. With additive manufacturing, you're not restricted to die draw or uh, undercuts or things like that. You can end up having much greater variation to your design. You can also have customization. So you can have a design that's specific to each person inside a vehicle or something like that. Uh, you can go faster going from concept to production much quicker because now you don't have to worry about cutting an injection mold. Um, and then you can also apply things like generative design, which can give you computationally driven part performance improvements. The design freedom is great and a huge part of additive manufacturing, but looking at automotive's specific you know, collision repair, the design freedom is typically not used because by the time it makes it to you, it's it's already made. It's already a vehicle. It's already in production. It's already something that's existed once. So looking at a collision repair, cost reduction, and time to market are typically the about cutting an aluminum tool. You can rapid prototype um, some of those parts. I'm getting a message. My internet's unstable. So jump in and tell me if I'm cutting out or something like that. I've only uh, seen one glitch, but you're so far okay, Steve. It's keep okay, going. Good, good, perfect. Thank you. Um, so for cost reduction, rapid prototyping. So if there's a, a repair that needs to be made that would ultimately drive back to the OEM of having a tool change for something that's injection molded, you can quickly iterate and get that prototype done quickly. Uh, spare parts, you can have uh, printed on demand versus having to carry stock or having to pull an injection mold, qualify it, run it, only to produce maybe five or 10 parts needed to restock your, your supply. And then uh, again, you're dramatically reducing prototype investment, but that's not typically something that's concerned at, at this level. Um, from time to market, again, you can drive down your time from weeks down to days, especially when compared to injection molding. Uh, if something's not in stock, you have to pull the tool out, requalify it, produce the parts, pack, ship, get them to a warehouse, get them into the warehouse, and then pull them back out. If you can cut out as much of time as you can, uh, it's something that could end up making a pretty big impact to the customer, especially if they're down a vehicle because they're waiting on a part. If you can have one made immediately, then that's a, an improvement to the customer experience. Um, the other things, you're not having to invest in, in tools. Your supply chain can be much simpler, all coming from one location versus many distributed across the country. Um, you can go faster. Transport time can be reduced in some cases if that's uh, the approach that they're taking. But you can have a lot of benefits from cost reduction and time to market by taking advantage of additive. Those Specific parts that we're looking at, especially in the, the collision repair industry, um, they can be anything from packing and storing and custom tooling all the way up to uh, personalized parts or short runs or aftermarket components. And that's typically where you guys would end up falling. Um, and you're competing at this point directly against injection molding. So um, for the, the packing, storing, and transportation, if there is a, a recall that has a specific part that needs to get shipped out and it needs to be held in a specific way, um, you could go out and look at cutting foam inserts or you could look at custom cardboard or something like that. 
or you could 3D print a protector to go over the delicate part of that that repair that needs to come out to you. For ergonomic and custom tooling, there's situations where if you need a, a repair done that needs to be done in the right way, it can help with error proofing. Uh, and I've got a short video I'll show on that in a moment. Short runs, um, if it's something that's affected just a small series of vehicles, instead of cutting a tool, you can just print them. Um, if you cut a tool for $10,000 and you only produce 10 parts, those parts are each $1,000. If you are going to look at 3D printing those, maybe they don't need to cost $1,000. Um, and then aftermarket, right? So after a vehicle is out of production, um, if uh, a tier one or a tier two or three or four goes out of business, then all of a sudden the tool is lost. And are you going to cut an injection mold just to sell 10, 20 pieces a year? Those are going to end up being pretty expensive parts. So all of these are areas where additive can make sense. And there's someone like me on the other side of the additive manufacturing world that is looking at these and hoping that you guys would bring them up and say, hey, this is an opportunity that we can we can look at together and we can help bring that to fruition. Um, I'm going to jump out of the presentation and I'm going to talk about an ergonomic slash custom tool that I think is really good. Um, and it's not actually an HP part, but um, this is actually the Cybertruck. So there was a pretty well publicized uh, recall earlier this year where they had uh, a cover over the pedal that was sliding off uh, as the customers were using it. And this is actually the repair process that they used. And you can see here that the repair was to uh, basically apply a rivet to that cover so it couldn't slide forward or back and forward. Um, and the repair technician that's doing this takes a small block with an insert in it and uses that to perfectly align the hole that they're about to drill into the pedal and then eventually put a rivet into it. And although I don't know this for sure, this part right here has all of the hallmarks of being 3D printed. This would not be an HP part. This would be from another technology, but uh, it looks very much like it would be printed and it fits perfectly into the 3D printing space. There's not that many of them that, that are going to be required. There's only maybe a few hundred, maybe a few dozen service stations for Tesla in the United States. Only a few hundred or thousand of the vehicles actually needed to have this repair performed. And by having this tool for them, it allows them to put the, the hole in the same spot every time and have it be as professional of a repair as it can be. So this fits perfectly into the collision area because it's a fix that they had to do within the, the vehicle after it's already been made. Although this wasn't actually in an accident, it's something that would be down at a, a, a repair shop or a service station or something like that. So I think this is a great example of using additive in, in this space um, because it, it works quite well, right? It's a simple tool. It was cheap to make, error-proofed, and the repair looks very professional um, compared to just taking a drill and punching a hole in it wherever you could. So back to the presentation. Um, looking at the life cycle of... of uh, production volume of a of a vehicle versus time along the life cycle. Um, production volume at the very beginning of the, the development cycle is very low. We're talking about prototypes, bridge production maybe as they're starting to get the vehicles produced and they've got a late tool or they've got a tool that needs to be changed. They can 3D print parts in the place of those injection molded parts until the injection mold is ready. Um, prototyping, they need to make sure everything is going to work as well as they can. And then during manufacturing, obviously, this is the peak of production. They're going to be making the most parts that they can at this point. Um, this is the most challenging area to get additive parts approved for because the volumes typically make injection molding very cheap. Um, and additive manufacturing, relatively speaking, is typically more expensive than injection molding, especially at a scale like this. The break-even, it depends on the part, it depends on the size, it depends on the geometry, how complex it is. If you can combine parts from one, you know, maybe 10 parts down into five parts using 3D printing. Um, but the break-even is typically lower than 5,000 parts. Um, 
you know, for things that would maybe make sense. And if you're under a thousand, that's when things really start to heat up and we can really make a good business case for additive manufacturing. And then uh, for you guys, uh, the service MRO and aftermarket space, that's where things uh, also make a lot of sense because once it's out of production and it's not being run as a, a normal thing at the at the suppliers, now we can challenge them and say, hey, it costs you $2,000 to pull that tool out of storage, bring it all the way back to the molding site, clean all of the rust off of it, make sure it still works. If it's not working, you got to pull it back out and send it over to the tool shop and have them regrind it, send it back to the mold, requalify it, repeat it, and then produce a couple dozen parts. So at the back end of things, we can also make a pretty big impact there, um, especially if we're looking at very aged vehicles, you know, something that's been out of out of production for 30, 40 years. Now we can really compete with them. And then along the bottom here, you'll see along this entire life cycle is jigs and fixtures. So those are needed throughout the entire process up in development. If you need to do a trial, you can have a jig and fixture to do that during manufacturing in the plants where they're actually building the vehicles. Um, there's tons of different areas where a door needs to be held in place or a, a panel needs to be held while something is screwed into it. And then on the aftermarket side, um, going back to what I was saying earlier about the, set, the, the Tesla Cybertruck pedal example, um, we can have fixtures or, or dedicated tools to help make repairs. So all of these uh, are going to require materials, and HP has a fairly broad material portfolio. It's definitely bigger than it was a few years ago. The biggest running material by a fair margin is PA-12, and that's not a typical automotive material. If you look at what is in a vehicle, it's typically polypropylene or a mix of polypropylene and some other filler. Um, PA-12 is the biggest running material because it's easy to process in the 3D printing side. So it's it runs very well in the printers. It's an engineering material. It's not that expensive, relatively speaking, to the other additive manufacturing materials. It's, str it's strong. It's isotropic, which is a really big win. Um, so it, it checks a lot of boxes that helps make it the most adopted material for, for multi-jet fusion. Other than that, we've got PA-11, which gives you a little bit more ductility, polypropylene, which gives you some chemical resistance and the ability to weld it, uh, PA-12 glass bead, which is stiff and heat resistant. So if you need uh, something that's closer to the engine or near somewhere that would get warm, glass bead can help with that as a higher HDT. Something that's not typically used in the automotive space is nylon white. So most of the parts coming out of the multi-jet printers are like this dark powdery gray. We do have an option to have white parts as well, but in the automotive space, it's not really adopted that well. Uh, we're not limited to rigid materials though. We do also have elastomers, so uh, rubber-based materials. There's three, one from BASF, uh, and then uh, another from Lubrizol called the E-stain material, and there's also a TPA. All of these have different uh, properties. So some are stiffer, some have higher elongation, some have better uh, abrasion resistance, et cetera. Um, but they all sort of have their own unique place within the, um, the ecosystem. Uh, one of the really nice things about these is they're, they're soft touch. So if you need to have a, a tool that is non-marring or something like that, you can print a cover for it, or you can print the entire tool out of this. Um, in the past, we've seen people that are trying to machine or cast uh, soft durometer materials to help with that. And because we don't have to worry about you know, going really slow because we're machining rubber or having to pull the part out of a mold or making a mold uh, and having a base on it, um, we, we can really take advantage of that freedom of design to make things really nice for the, the people that are ending up using all these tools. We also have some production components made out of uh, some of these materials, and I've got a case study that shows some of them towards the end. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the, the parts coming out of the printer are this dark powdery gray, um, and that's typically not accepted by a lot of the automotive OEMs as being okay or acceptable for a class A finish. 
Um, that's just part of how the process works. And I'll talk about the process itself in a moment as well. But the, the parts come out this like dark powdery gray. And if it's a tool or a fixture or something like that, typically it's okay because it's just a tool. It's not going to be seen by the end customer. But we do have situations where we will have parts seen by the end customer in vehicle. So we want to go through that entire process of making it meet OEM class A requirements. There's a bunch of different ways we can go about that. Um, and we have an entire team actually dedicated to making parts look good, but ultimately it comes down to dyeing the parts, painting the parts or finishing the parts in some other way. And almost always it results in a combination of the of those options where you're adding a texture to it, you're adding a coating, you're dyeing it to make it look not 3D printed. You want it to look as close to injection molding as possible. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, typically repair parts are not printed when you can see them as a customer. There's a few that are out there that unfortunately I can't talk about because they're very proud that they've made them not look like a 3D printed part to the point where you probably wouldn't even notice. Um, but it's it's usually it's, it's stuff that's under the hood or hidden behind the, the panels or something like that. But there are a few repair parts that are visible. And all of this, you're not in a vacuum when this is happening. Um, there's a very large team back at HP that is dedicated to help bringing all of this to fruition. I am just one of many people that are working on the automotive space. So if you did have a question and you wanted to come back, um, you could reach out to me and I'll get you in touch with all the people that we would need to. But um, there's many different areas and services that HP does provide. So if you needed help with geometry optimization, we can help with that. Um, if you needed custom processes for R&D to really tune in your uh, dimensional accuracy, we also have that. The cosmetics, like I said. Um, lattices, not probably super relevant here, but we do have it. Uh, and then body scanning, that's more meant for the orthotics and prosthetics industry. Um, not talked about enough, I, I think, is the sustainability of additive manufacturing. Um, when you look at someone who's considering repairing something versus throwing it away and buying a new one. We've got situations where 3D printing can help make repair feasible, whether that's a tool that assists with the repair or if it's uh, you know cutting off a piece and gluing a new one on that was 3D printed. Um, you know that's that's great. It helps keep things out of the landfill. We also have uh, analysis that directly compares the life cycle analysis of an injection molded part to a 3D printed part. So we can give you along the same lines of, of a quote for price, we can give you a quote for carbon footprint as well. And we're really happy to say that uh, all of the materials, PA12, are produced using green energy to help with that um, life cycle analysis. So we can give you, in addition to cost savings and optimization and moving faster, we can give you a sustainability story too. Um, so I haven't talked actually about how MultiJet works and I think it's pretty cool. So I'm gonna jump over to a YouTube video that shows exactly how it works because it's actually pretty sweet. So uh, I'm gonna keep it muted and I'll narrate over it. Um, so within the printer, it's a fairly large device. This is industrial equipment. We have the, the process called multi-jet fusion. And inside the printer, the first step is a thin layer of powder is going to be spread across the build uh, chamber. So you'll see that first happen right here. So it spreads a thin layer of powder, and then it's actually going to print using black ink onto that white powder. It's gonna print onto it using print heads, very like your home printer. That black ink is actually going to promote energy absorption. And so think about a hot car in the sun, a black car versus a white car. The black car gets a little bit warmer in the sun versus the white car. The same thing is happening inside the printer. Where we have colored the powder black, it's absorbing more energy than the white powder around it. And that kicks the powder temperature over the melting temperature. And then it fuses to the layer below it. 
This will happen hundreds of times throughout the build, and you will end up with a part that's encased in excess powder. That excess powder is then recovered using a vacuum system, and then you finally have your, your end up 3D printed part. And that's what's leading to that um, sort of fuzzy texture. So I'm going to play the entire thing again so you can see it one more time. But uh, inside the printer, you've got the build chamber, thin layer of powder, print heads come across and print black ink onto that white powder. The black ink helps promote energy absorption. It kicks it over the melting temperature of the powder itself, and then it fuses to the layer below it. You then add another layer of white powder and repeat the process. So that's the fusing agent. There's actually two agents. One is a detailing agent to help hold the fine features. And then it's going to apply the energy. And that's going to fuse that powder to the layer below it. And it works quite well. Um, one of the unique things about our process is it's, since it's an area-wide scanning process, the build will take the exact same amount of time as any other build as long as it's the same height. So if you have a full height build that's got a thousand pieces in it, it will take the same amount of time as a full height build that has one piece in it, um, which makes things a little bit more unique from a costing perspective. Um, this is what the equipment actually looks like, you know, if it were to be in a shop somewhere. Um, you've got a processing station that helps recover the powder, the printer itself, and then that build cart that helps move things around. Um, there's also a natural cooling unit that can help optimize some of your processes. I'm not going to let the entire video go, but this is just what the equipment physically looks like. All right, so we'll go back to the presentation. So looking at what HP offers from a, a portfolio, we do have three different sections. The first is an entry level, lower cost 5000 printer. We then have our highest runner, the 5200. And we now have the uh, production scale 5600. So the 5000 is meant for people that are just towing their, you know, putting their toe into the water of trying to try out the technology and make sure that it's good for them. They can then upgrade to a 5200 through the fully upgradable platform. So your printer doesn't actually uh, require re replacement. They can come in and change up the parts to get you to a 5200. Most of our install base is 5200s. It's one of the, the biggest um, if you look at powder bed fusion, it's one of the most widely adopted uh, platforms out there. And then if you're running true production of your, your parts, uh, we would recommend upping to the 5600, which gives you a lot of uh, process development, allows you to go in and tune things exactly to what you would need. Looking at uh, all of this, it can be a bit daunting. It can be, it can look expensive. And that's where we rely on our digital manufacturing network. So we have a, a large install base of people that are just printing parts for anywhere from aerospace to prosthetics to automotive. And sort of each of these service bureaus have their own little niche carved out. So if you weren't quite ready to look at equipment, this is where we would recommend you speak with them. And if your application maybe isn't a quite great, perfect fit for, for multi-jet fusion, this is where they would come in because almost all of them have a suite of different equipment beyond HP. So if you needed a clear part, for example, HP doesn't really offer anything at this point that is clear, and that's where we would refer you to our, our manufacturing network and we would help you get the right solution that you need. Um, so one of the biggest you know, concerns or, or things that are out there are, are people producing unapproved parts. And that's uh, another really big advantage of, of working with a, a larger additive manufacturing company like HP is we have put in the effort to go through a lot of the certifications that are out there. Um, we have approval to be uh, interior components on vehicles from a flammability perspective. Uh, UL has what's called a blue card, which is a uh, additive manufacturing standard for flammability and toxicity of parts. 
Um, there's white papers on dimensional accuracy. There's, you know, cyto cytotoxicity of if you're touching it, it's going to make sure it's not going to make you sick. Um, so when you're looking at, you know, maybe a, a concern could be to, to the industry is someone that goes out and buys a $200 3D printer and says, hey, I'm going to start printing this part because I had it break on my 2002 Subaru. And now I think I can sell it on Amazon because... I made it and it worked for me. And that's great and fine and all for a cup holder. But when someone has like a driver assist system go bad and they fix it themselves and they turn around and they start selling covers on Amazon, the customer that's buying those covers on the other side may not know that it's just someone in their garage that's printing parts. And so what we can offer is, is legitimacy. We're a manufacturing process and we're recognized as a manufacturing process from the OEMs. One of the ones that I always love to reference is GMW 18642. And if anybody's ever worked closely with GM, the, the GMW um, basically is gold, right? This is the gold standard of what you must do to produce production parts. And this was established um, a couple of years ago now. And basically it lays out what you will expect from multi-jet fusion areas that it may or may not work for multi-jet fusion and and gives you know some expected like tensile values and things like that some other uh, material properties and the really nice thing and one of the most selfless things that general motors did was this is a public standard so anyone can go out and purchase this and review it and understand that hey this is not just a 200 dollars 3d printer at somebody's house this is a manufacturing process that is recognized for production parts, for spare parts, for in-plant usage, because GM went through all the effort to do this. And I've dropped the link right here. I'm not sure if they're going to send out this um, deck afterwards, but you can just search GMW 18647, uh, and it'll come up on Google. And I think it's like 40 bucks. It's, it's really not that expensive. So a uh, huge win from, from this case. Um, so I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to go through a few different case studies. Some of these are more relevant than others, but I want to show you some actual parts that have actually been used by customers. And these are just the public ones, right? We've worked closely with Volkswagen to produce this slide that basically says, hey, Volkswagen, you're allowing us to talk about this publicly to help us advance additive as a whole. Um, this is not an all-inclusive list or anywhere even close to all-inclusive. There's so much more going on that they don't want to talk about uh, or that these companies don't want to talk about because it's considered a competitive advantage. But we do have a few good case studies. So um, this is an alignment assembly tool. Going back to that Tesla example, um, they basically are using this to place the VW badge into it and then align it onto the front of the vehicle. So while this is an implant part, um, if there was ever a scenario where the repair shops were having to do something like this, instead of CNCing this or cutting an injection mold or something like that, they would just print the tool to help you uh, do that alignment. Looking at this example, um, this is a surface fixture. Uh, basically, there was a small part that was resting on it during assembly. One of the cool things about this is it's actually a two-part assembly. The bottom piece is nylon 12, and the top is a, a TPU. So you've got the rigidity of the nylon 12, as well as the soft touch of the TPU on the top. Uh, another great example, this one from Ford, this is an implant usage where they had a robot applying a wax sealant, and it was a very complex reach for the robot to get into. And the robot, if the part was misaligned ever, just so, would smash the nozzle right into the side of the part and break it off. When these were originally made out of metal or a bent tube, uh, it was very expensive because it would bend it, they would have to pull it out, they would have to get a new one. Um, with 3D printing, they're much more affordable. And now if a robot does break one off, they can just pop it off and put a new one on and they don't have to wait for one to be made. General Motors, CT4 and CT5 Blackwing. So a very low volume, high performance, expensive vehicles. If you were to take those cars and rip apart the dashboard, you would find two uh, multi-jet fusion parts in the, in the IP. 
Uh, both of them are HVAC ducts. They're those uh, blue dyed parts that we see here. Um, but this is a production part, right? So this was in the vehicle from the day it left the plant. And if they ever did need a replacement one for whatever reason, it would come from that same 3D printing technology. Uh, a good example of uh, bridge production from General Motors was the spoiler seal closeout. So this was uh, on the very top of a Tahoe. There's a small gap that they had to fill with a seal. For whatever reason, the tool wasn't cut on time and they were looking at delaying the entire launch of the vehicle. Instead of delaying it, they decided to start 3D printing the seals instead to help keeping, keep the line moving even though they were printing them at a cost penalty relative to injection molding, it had a net benefit because they were moving things along. And then I think this is the last one from Peugeot. This is a car accessory. So it fills the, the um, cup holder of the, the front cup holder area. And there's a few different designs where one is a cell phone holder, one is a sunglasses holder, and one is uh, meant for a smaller can like a Red Bull or something like that. Um, and these are available for purchase still today on their website. And it's a printed elastomer that comes with a, a coating on it to make it look really nice. Um, but this is a, an example of a car accessory. So that's all I had for slides today. Um, I really, I hope you guys enjoyed this and I can turn it back over to Jordan if there's any Q and A in the, um, in the chat. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, that was great. We we don't have some questions yet, but we want to make sure people know that they can use the Q&A function. Uh, but in the meantime, so I, I would like to go back to uh, where you were talking about parts in the functionality of safety systems. Uh, can you speak a little bit to, you know, what if, are these parts, um, especially in outside of like the OE downline, right? If we're buying one directly from an OEM, and it's a printed part like that that's supported in the process they obviously know that as part of their pr procedures and protocols so especially when it comes to you know especially with our air pro hats on as well you know what what kind of parts are are there aftermarket uh people out there that are causing problems that we know of already uh because you kind of alluded to those who might want to sell them on amazon but let's just generally start with as part of the repair process, if these are in the peripheral of calibration or ADAS systems, what does that mean to you? What should we be cognizant of as repairers? So to, to me, it's it, making sure you're purchasing from a legitimate source, right? And there's a couple different things that the OEMs are exploring to help make sure that you are getting it from a, a legitimate source. Um, I. I don't quote me on this, but I think it's Ford had applied for a patent that had internal structures to the part. So if you've got your printed part, because you're building it layer by layer, you can actually embed inside that part that normally wouldn't be visible to the outside person, a QR code or a, a number or a serial number or something like that, that would only be visible under something like x-ray or MRI. And although that's not something that is you know, like a, a service technician could pick it up and say, hey, this is counterfeit. Um, if there ever did end up to be a, a counterfeit, counterfeit stream of parts coming in that weren't validated or didn't have proof of, you know, being co uh, compatible with an ADAS system or a, a sensor or something like that, um, if there ever was that stream coming in, the OEMs would be able to get involved and identify where it was coming from and start to sort out where they can, they can take action to prevent that from happening. Um, it's, it's really cool stuff. And there's also some other things that I had seen where, uh, people were putting UV into the parts. So as you're printing it, you're applying a UV ink. So it's got a invisible to the normal eye, but if you were to put a black light on it, it would give you an image or a, a something like that. So another way of helping prevent, prevent or reduce counterfeit or non-validated parts coming in. So really I, I personally have yeah, I personally haven't seen any parts that I like on eBay or whatever that I've looked at and been like, oh, like, oh, gosh, like this is something that I should send them, you know, send to the Ford people I know um, right away. So I, I personally haven't experienced that, but I'm sure it is happening out there at some sort of scale. You guys are seeing our question screen again, just to validate. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. 
Jordan, I got one real quick. Uh, first of all, I had some questions about injection. I have a good friend that's in the middle of that, and and uh, I'm fascinated by it. But you know, he's like, if if you don't want me to make twenty thousand, don't don't come here. You know, mm -hmm. he he wants to do volume, uh, and it's kind of tricky. So I appreciate that information. What about um, OEMs? You know, and first of all, let me just say OEMs they do a phenomenal job. They build a great car. It, it, there's it is amazes me of what they do and how they do it from building the car to maintaining and so on. But when it comes to aftermarket parts, you know, OEs are sensitive to that. And one mm -hmm. of the things that they've done, as you know, is put their they put their logo on on a part, which then kind of changes how that part might live in the aftermarket. Do you, you know, these little clips, and these things that you need, and we're talking about, you know, getting consumers back in the car and all those good things. It does, it does the, and does your side have any issues with, well, that's got a, they, they stuck a, a Ford logo on that and we can't, we can't print it. Is that, is that an issue at all? Well, HP doesn't have any built-in restriction software or anything like that. Um, we, you know, I was, I, I think this back to like, a, if you try to photocopy a hundred dollar bill, right? If you try to take a hundred dollar bill and put it on your printer and photocopy it, it won't do. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> not that I, I did not try this. Don't, don't try that. I did, yeah. Don't want to get those people called on you, but um, I've seen on the internet that if you try to do it, it won't work. Uh, and HP doesn't have anything built into its software that would prevent you from printing Ford logos or GM logos or anything like that. Um, and that's why the, OE, the top level OEMs are taking counterfeit so seriously and they're putting investments into anti-counterfeiting uh, because anybody can go out and buy a printer, even an HP system, right? If you want to come out and buy a printer that's, you know, it fairly sizable investment, um, you can do that, right? And we are not going to hold your hand and make sure you're not printing anything you shouldn't. Um, but if Ford finds out that there's, you know, streams of parts coming in that they would have to take legal action to, to try and stop that. Uh, yeah, it's that not even be. just Ford, right? See, because we've had yeah. presentations at CIC for anti-counterfeiting agencies. So mm -hmm. like PSA, it's not just Ford that would come after you. It's the ah, federal yeah. government. <laughs> yeah, that, um, they, would, right. they would ruin your day. I have a question. Are there other countries like that are more advanced maybe than we are in this area? Are there other places where this is more prevalent already in use? So Europe uh, has a pretty good installation base. I would say the Europe and the United States are about on par. Um, if we're looking at OEMs with adoption, there are some OEMs in Europe that are ahead of those in the United States. And there's some in the United States that are ahead of those in Europe. Um, it's sort of a case by case basis of who has decided to invest early and be the, the early adopters. Um, I, I'm pretty comfortable saying that all OEMs have some level of, of additive um, understanding at the collision, aftermarket, and even production space. Some have much more than others. Um, but it, you know, it just depends on who you're talking to and who is willing to invest in that development up front. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that are working on it at, at some of the OEMs. There's they have pretty big teams of people that are investigating this. I wouldn't say that anyone is dramatically ahead of anybody else, though. Uh, we're coming up. Uh, time might be an issue here, but let me just throw this out. I don't know if you need to answer it. Maybe Jordan and I will end up arguing about this later. And that is. The issue of, I mean, a whole bunch comes to my mind. I'm claim representative. I'm, I've got limited uh, rental coverage left. Uh, the car isn't complete yet because they're waiting for this little clip. You know, do you see adjusters going, hey, can you print that? Can you print the damn, excuse me, the part and we can get this car going? I mean, is that one of them? How are those parts George, listed on the estimate? Are they aftermarket? Are they OEM? How are they listed? What do I see? Uh, so I don't know where we cover that, but from the insurance perspective, uh, you know, I light up with the idea that, hey, I'm sure repair does too. If the way I can get this thing done quicker, faster, and get it out and get another car in, here's what I want to do. What I want to get is people back in their cars. Uh, 
So have you been down that road at all of how these things appear on estimates and how they're reviewed? Any of that? I, I don't need to get really into yeah, it. Yeah, not, not how they appear on estimates. Um, one of the, the key things that I always want to come back to is validation, right? The worst thing that we could do is print a part that should not be printed and it negatively impacts someone down the line. So if there is a part that is out of stock or something like that, what we don't want to have happen is somebody just say, okay, I've got the broken one. I've sort of glued it together. I three scanned it and I threw it in the printer and now I have another part because the materials, as much as we would like them to be the same, they're slightly different, right? And so that's what we don't want to have happen is somebody saying like, I need this right now. I can't find it because I don't know the, the part number. I didn't do any testing on it. I don't know if it's going to work but I printed it and I got it in the car and the customer's on the way, right? And there's there's sort of a, a, a lowering of ex expectations as time goes on because do you need a, a seat recliner handle that will last 30 years if the car is already 30 years old? Maybe not. Maybe it lasting 10 years is okay. But that's where it gets a little bit complicated of, all right, who signs on to saying, 10 years is okay versus 30. And the examples that I referenced and some of the other ones that are out there, um, they're coming from the top level OEM saying, hey, we have buy off internally saying that this is okay. And it's usually produced, you know, in, in conjunction by those top level OEMs. It's not like a third party or something producing it. But that's a great question about how do you, how would you list it on an estimate, right? How do you cost it? How do you, how do you make it something that you can distribute to everybody? And then if you do revalidate all of this stuff and spend the time and money and effort to revalidate it, what do you do when the top level OEM says, oh, shoot, we realized that this tool was bad and we cut a new one anyway because they weren't clued in with additives, um, you know, advantages. Well, now all of your effort to bring 3D printing to the, to the, to the side here is out the window, right? So... You know, it's it's new, it's fledging, it's growing, and there's a lot of questions like that, and and that's why we want to talk about it with with places like this, so we can get some of those answers hammered out. Sure, which I see. Uh, so, and we do have a question actually. Um, that was it's a two part question because it started out with, are there companies that have already applied 3D printing for commercial use in the parts space, and then. I meant for independent companies which specialize in 3D printing, so outside of the OEs. Are we seeing aftermarket parts? I, there's question. multiple channels here, right? Because there's everything from, you know, known company sources for aftermarket parts. And then there's all the way down to, like you were saying earlier, Amazon, um, you know, varied within there. That's the question. And, and there are, right. And there are on all levels, right. Um, and going back to you guys and what will make this a challenge for you is how do you establish legitimacy to those that are pro providing these parts? Do you trust their testing processes? Do you trust that even though it's not necessarily a OEM design or an OEM approved part, that it will work the same? And at some point, it, it's going to end up being a cost analysis too, right? If the OEM part is $1,000 and the third party printed part is 50 bucks. You know, it, it, it's going to be a conversation you would have to have. And that's where, again, validation, making sure it physically will work is the most important thing here. Which I, so that leads me to my very last question. I know George and I uh, also need to do our wrap up here, um, but maybe something to think about for the future uh, is, you know, recalls, you know, how would you find out? if there was something wrong with it on a global, you know, and, and when they're printed, what's the consistency? Is there lots, is there tracking? Like those would be the remaining questions, but we can save those for when these become more prevalent, maybe. Yeah. And, and there's, there's ways of tracking things like that, right? Additive manufacturing, you can customize each part. You can put a serial number that's different on every part and at basically no cost, right? So there's, op there's ways of doing such a thing, but there's a lot of questions out there and it, it's taking people putting their first toe in the water to actually make it a reality. Well, Steve, I really appreciate all of this yeah. information today. It feels Thank very you, cutting edge and a lot to think about.
Well, awesome. good presentation Thank and good you. information, man. I, you rolled through that quick. I appreciate that. That was good. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And if anybody has any questions, reach out to me on LinkedIn, or if you have any opportunities you want to want to discuss, absolutely no idea is a bad idea. Um, we've had crazy things done in the past. So excited to hear from everybody. Great. Thanks so much. Thank Steve. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, Jordan and I like to do a little, uh, <laughs> like you said, armchair quarterback at the end. Uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate Stephen doing the doing it. So I'll just start, Jordan. And I started down the road. How does this appear on the estimate? You've got now, you know, you've got, um, my guess is you got repairs going great. Now here's another thing that the insurance company is going to be going, hey, can you print that from over here? I found this printed thing over here. And I want to put that on the estimate. And I, and I, you know, it's this balance. You got a repairer who is responsible for the repair, who knows you got the car in front of them. They know what they want to do. And I trust them to recognize the good and bad parts. But, uh, you know, this is just a, another thing. And I'm wondering, you know, how quickly, and of course, I think the insurance roundtable might be a, so, a resource for insurers to, to just get some additional information on how they are going to be listed on the estimate. Can I ask for that? Can I uh, source from one of those independents? So the estimate to me is, is got, but I will say we're a hell of a lot farther ahead now because you know darn well, there are Amazon parts sitting on cars right now because mm -hmm. some creative repairs. And I think it's, it's excellent. They're, they're trying to help their customer, trying to get a part, found that, got it done got them back in their car, got them back on their life, and uh, it, you know, maybe didn't have the, the approval. So I think the estimate's going to be interesting. What yeah, are your I, thoughts about that? Do you think the repairs are going to bristle at insurers starting to go, hey, I found another opportunity here? So it, ultimately, at the end of the day, the person who repairs the vehicle holds the liability for the repair, right? That's That's, I think, a very good reminder in this situation that as a repairer, your obligation is to repair that vehicle properly and utilizing, especially in the ma matters of safety components, verifiable safe parts. So I, I think this is going to be a matter of risk versus reward on all fronts. Um, obviously, if the insurer sees that and they come to a shop and say, hey, we see an opportunity for you know, this um, aftermarket sourced 3D printed part, which it may not even, that's a whole nother rabbit trail we could go down, George's, but how do we know? And how do we know what it's made of, right? Validation, like he said, I think to me is the key. The repairer has to be able to trust that if this part fails, that there is a system to support them, uh, especially in the safety component makes me very nervous. I will automatically say that. If it has anything peripherally to do, and I saw bumper covers in there, so, you know, those are the things that concern me as, as far as like the safety components factor, but also with our AirPro hat on, right? Like we could even just say, hey, when it comes to calibrations, when it comes to uh, ADAS systems in general, what will this affect recalibrating, diagnostics, any of those aspects? I think those are the important factors to think about is, you know, is this, is this an opportunity maybe to save time? if it does save time. Uh, but if it if it's not a matter of saving time or if the money is not the factor for the customer, it's always safety first. Yeah, I agree. I agree on the safety part, but there's a heck of a lot of parts. I haven't been a technician many years ago. You know, how many times oh, I broke that bracket? God dang it. And, uh, you know, obviously you can get them from the OEM, but, you know, it opens the door for a lot of creativity. I trust the repair facilities. I mean, I, I they're obviously they're working on the car. They, as you said, they're responsible. They need to know. But at the same time, uh, you know, I I think the insurers have an obligation to help insurers keep the rates down. And, and uh, so, and, and it's case by case. What I'm hearing, it's just like it's case by case. Hey, we normally don't do this. I've got a special situation. I've got a customer, consumer. Here's the story. I think we can get this done through a 3D and, and everybody that's involved has, has approved it. I certainly Yeah, I still think Amazon's not the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like I, I do feel like trusted parts channels 
uh, would make more sense. Verifiable in yeah, some but then way, you're shape, gonna, or form. And you're going to end up with somebody, you know, that's got some resources that goes, you know what? I'm getting in this space. I'm getting 5,200. I'm getting this 6,400. I'm getting the big one or whatever yeah. it is. And so Which, we're going to have shops who are going to instinctively see the value of producing that. And what it really opened my eyes was fixtures. You know, when you want to put a molding on or you yes. want to, this example, you can print something real quick in your shop and go, hey, everybody use this to put this on the car. It'll be quicker, faster and easier. I see that happen. Yeah. Which I know we're only one minute over. So I would just add this too. like I would I would really be looking at some of those time frames that are on there. Is it? is it really faster, right? Once you could, because you have to design it, you'd have to print it, you'd have to do all of that. Is, you know, I would be measuring, is that really faster than sourcing what is already readily available in the market? I don't know how fast we're going to have shops having their own 3D printers. Interesting. But it's something to think about for sure. All right. I hope everybody had a good time. Thought provoking. I'm talking to you. Time goes by even faster. I thought it was a great call though. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And uh, I'll just end with also our next Tech Talk is November 20th. Mark calendars. I'm sure it's uh, readily available shortly. And uh, Fred, right. we'll turn it back over to you, but we really appreciate the opportunity. Right. I think that was great information. Yep. Thanks, for Fred. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, and I, I agree. And thank you guys.